Hello friends, welcome back to Equip Kingdom. This is where we come together to dig deep into God's word so that we learn who he is, who we are in Christ Jesus and how we live in his kingdom. So glad to be back with you. We're starting chapter 15 today. Yay! Uh, we finished chapter 14 last time. As always, I love to welcome Holy Spirit in to guide our hearts as we study his good and perfect word. So let's do that. Let's welcome Holy Spirit in to guide us. I'm so grateful to you, God. I'm so grateful to you that in the midst of our mess, in the midst of our brokenness, you who love us so greatly, you sent us your beloved son to come into our mess in a way that only he could glorify it. And so we just thank you for that. We thank you that because Jesus is our ladder back up to heaven, that we have a way to you. Because Jesus is Emmanuel with us, we are never without you. Because Jesus spent, sent his Holy Spirit to us, we now have heaven within us. And so I pray that you guard our hearts, those of us who are listening and those whom we touch, that we not cheapen any of that, that we not lose sight of your perfect words and your perfect promise and your perfect actions by imposing our own traditions, our own ways of, of putting you into our box. May we never put you into a box, Lord, but may you always expand our boundaries, expand our world, expand our kingdom influence that you have given us. May our little garden of, of kingdom that we tend, may it be fruitful and grow all for your glory. And this I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So here we are. Uh, last time in chapter 14, we finished up the chapter with Jesus revealing his divine nature and with Peter doing with what only God could do as long as he kept his focus on Jesus. And then we see how Jesus' recognition and his, his growing popularity and influence is, is, is rapidly growing with the people, right? But at the same time, it's creating this challenge and threat to the way that the Pharisees have assumed their power and authority, that they being the authority over the word of God is now being openly challenged by one who doesn't look like them, who doesn't speak like them, who doesn't talk like them, yet undeniably has God's favor and power within, and, and he shares it with everyone. And so this is where we're going to pick up today, right? So Jesus has attracted the attention now of the Jerusalem Pharisees, right? This is a big deal. Before he had been dealing with the Galilean uh, Pharisees, and they confront Jesus once again on the actions of his disciples, just as the Galilean counterparts had done earlier in Matthew 12. So let's go ahead and start our time today with Matthew 15, verses 1 and 2. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, we assume that this is taking place after Passover, since it really would have been unimaginable for Jerusalem Pharisees to have left Jerusalem to confront Jesus during Passover, right? That, that just wouldn't have happened. So we're assuming it's after Passover now. So a couple days have gone by at least, if not a few more than that. And so we have the Pharisees and they come to Jesus once again. And these are the, the big bads of the, Thar well, not big bad, but they're the powerhouse of the Pharisees and that they do come from Jerusalem. And so I thought it might be interesting for you since they tend to get a pretty bad rap to give you some background and history on the Pharisees so that you have a little understanding of where they came from. So let's take our let's take our time back uh, over 500 years. Um, after resettling in Judea, uh, after the return of the exile and captivity from first the Assyrians and then the Babylonians and then eventually the Persians, there were two religious groups that emerged. First, there were the Zadokim, who called themselves the righteous. Zadokim refers to the righteous. 
who only would follow the law of Moses. These people eventually became the Sadducees. And then there were the Kassadim, and they were they referred to themselves as the pious. And they added the traditions of the Jewish rabbis to the law, to God's law. In Jesus's time, or by Jesus's time, this group had split into really two factions. First, the Essenes, who set themselves apart by living apart from the population. They, they tended to choose wilderness areas. They lived modestly and communally, right? Like all property was shared sort of thing. And then there were, of course, the Pharisees, the other group of the Hasidim. And they didn't set themselves apart from the people by living apart from them. They set themselves apart by dressing differently than the people. Uh, and that's how they distinguished themselves. They held their traditions in equal, if not superior, uh, esteem to God's word. Now, these traditions were eventually all grouped together in something called the Talmud. And I've referred to this if you've been with our teaching for a while. The Talmud is really broken into two major groupings. The Mishnah, which are the written compilations of the oral law, the rituals, and traditions. And these were completed about 200 AD. So, what, about 170 years after Jesus' time. And then, of course, the Gemara which is the rabbinical commentary on the Mishnah, so on the traditions and rituals that the Mishnah developed. And we, that finishes quite a bit later. That's around 500 AD. So this is still very much, both are actually still very much in development during Jesus' time. So these Pharisees who are speaking to Jesus, challenging Jesus, they're in the business of, of writing and, and compiling the Mishnah, the Talmud, as we speak, right? As we're, as Jesus is with them. And of course, the a subgroup of the Pharisees are the scribes. And the scribes were the legal experts and teacher of Mosaic law and the traditions of the elders. So if you needed to know what the, the Torah said, you'd go to the scribes. And they were primarily, not always, but primarily Pharisees. And these were the individuals who were called rabbis in society, and they were revered. Like the scribes were held in the highest of esteem. And notice, I'm not talking about the priests at this point. And indeed, the priests are not in play at this point in time. The priests are only in Jerusalem. They're only at the temple. What we're dealing with now are the synagogue leaders and also the ones who are the, the experts over the word itself. Now, the evolution of the Talmud, it came in stages as you might imagine. So first, they added commentaries and traditions to supplement the scriptures because God doesn't outline everything, all aspects of life. It's it's really a, a guide that we can look to again and again. But if you're if you're especially only looking at the books of the law, there there are some things that needed interpretation and this is what they started with. And then those traditions and commentaries that were uh, initially developed, those traditions were, were given equal regard to the word of God and were treated as having equal authority. And then finally, and this is at the stage we're at now with Jesus, these traditions are honored as being above scripture as the basis for lawful ruling. So in essence, the, the Talmudic traditions became the foundation of Jewish law, which is called the Halakha. Now, starting with Ezra's teaching of the law in Nehemiah 8, which is when he, he and, and his priests, they, this is the group that had come back from exile. They're rebuilding Jerusalem. They're rebuilding the, the walls. They're even starting to rebuild the temple, right? Um, he and his priests, they, they bring out the law that they've been able to recover and they teach it to the people. Since that time, scribes began to copy and comment on these complex passages. Eventually, and again, we're talking about Jesus's time, some 500 years later, there's more interpretation of scripture than there is of scripture. <laughs> and the distinctions between scripture and the traditions initially based on scripture, they blurred and eventually tradition became more sacred. I'm guessing because it was more nuanced. Uh, 
That's my guess because it, it covered so much more specifics. And the Talmud teaches that God first gave the oral law to Moses, right? And then through Moses, it was to be passed down to those who were his heirs, right? The traditions, the elders, and the men who received the law were supposed to do three things with the law. And again, this is according to the Talmud, so this is according to man-made tradition. This is not in the word. First, they were supposed to deliberate on it and uh, properly apply it to Jews doing life. They were also supposed to train disciples to be teachers for future generations. And then finally, they were supposed to build a wall around the law uh, through creating and enforcing safeguards against breaking it. We talked about this in an earlier teaching, right? These were called the fences. So a great example of this would be where the mother goat's milk was never supposed to be served in the same uh, plate, in the same uh, meal with the, the meat of the baby goat. So in order to create a safeguard around this, you couldn't serve, you couldn't have dairy and, and meats in the same uh, place. You couldn't store them in the same place. You couldn't serve them on the same plates. You couldn't eat them with the same forks and, and spoons. You get the idea. That's that fence that prevents breaking God's law. And this is what they developed. And so you see, there's there's initially virtue in, in what they're doing. Their, their tradition is to, to prevent people from inadvertently breaking God's law. It's just over time, it got more uh, weight and authority to it because it was so much more extensive. So it was the duty then of the Pharisees, the ones who had received the oral law from Moses, to do these things with regard to the law. Now, the original commands that God gave with regard to washing, they applied mainly to the priests. And, and specifically, the priest's requirement to be clean before God in serving him and, and making applicable uh, offerings to him in the tabernacle and then eventually in the temple. And this is passed down initially in Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 to 21. Let's go ahead and read what God says to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. Now, God then repeats a similar command to the priests in Exodus 40. So the priests, in this case, they're engaging in a physical action of washing in order to realize and symbolize a spiritual truth of a spiritual heart positioning before the Lord, right? They wash their hands so that their hearts will be made clean. They're always cognizant of that when they wash their hands. Now, there are other commands that deal more specifically with hygiene, really. Uh, Leviticus 15.11 is a big one. This was also used as... Uh, a reference point to where the Jewish law that the Pharisees are confronting Jesus with, where it comes from. So there are several commandments that fit into this, and they, they have to do with washing generally after t touching something unclean. In Leviticus 15, 11 specifically, that's about a man who, after he he touches things that make him unclean, he, he washes his hands. And it's just good hygiene, folks. It really is. So the ritual cleanliness rules at the core of the Pharisees' indignation towards Jesus, these are likely called the first waters. And this is the requirement to wash their hands before eating a meal containing bread. So what happened was there was a two-handled cup that was used to first pour water. So first they would wash their hands, like normally wash their hands, and then they were would wash these hand, their hands ceremonially using this two-handled cup. So they would first pour water over their right hand and then rub their hands together and then wash over their left and rub their hands together. So 
after the, or while they were ceremonially washing their hands, they would also recite a blessing to the Lord. Now, what's interesting about that is that they weren't otherwise allowed to speak in any regard. So it was a it was a solemn time of, of washing and then ceremonially washing while giving a blessing to the Lord. Now, this was so important to the Pharisees that the Talmud, again, this is Jewish law, that the Talmud states that those who neglect the ritual, the ritual washing, are considered unchaste and risk divine punishment that would result in either their sudden destruction or poverty. Now, rabbis insisted that those who were traveling, that while they were traveling, that they would have to go as much as four miles out of their way in order to find a source of water in order to partake in this ritual, right? So if there was a known water source within four miles, they had to travel to it in order to, to wash their hands in this spiritual, well, this ritual way. Now, there are two illustrations from Jesus's time that really kind of show the the seriousness in which the Pharisees placed upon this. First, the Pharisees insisted that rabbis, that they wash in between courses of a meal. They were so serious about this that rabbis who neglected to wash in between courses of a meal, they would be excommunicated from the temple. It was a big deal, right? In Jesus' time, there's a story of a rabbi who had been imprisoned by the Romans. And while he was imprisoned, he was given a very, uh, a, well, a daily but meager uh, rationing of water. And that this rabbi almost died of thirst. He almost dehydrated himself because he chose to use the water to, to, to ceremonially wash his hands rather than drink it. So that, that just kind of gives you two stories that really signify just how seriously they took this. Now, again, this came as an evolution as well, because this isn't just the priest. I've shown you some of the seriousness in which the priests had to, and rabbis had to hold themselves. But the evolution of hand washing for everyone, it began as that requirement to the priests to wash prior to eating the foods that were sacrificed to God. This is not scriptural, right? God said, before you minister to me, before you even set foot in my tabernacle or my temple, you're going to wash. You're going to use that, that laver, that bronze basin, and wash yourself as a spiritual uh, purification to me, at least a symbolic one. Well, the Pharisees turned that into wash between the food given in sacrifice because the priests, that was their portion. It was the Levites' portion to eat the sacrificed meat. And again, this is derived from Leviticus 15.11. Again, it, may, it had a hygienic derivation to it, and that makes sense, but it became law. By Jesus' time, the law was ignored by priests. So priests are, the Levites are not necessarily uh, holding themselves under the same requirement as the Pharisees, or at least looking to the Pharisees as their source of authority. And so they ignored Pharisaical law often. Well, in order to make it, I guess, have more weight, they decreed that all Jews, priests and non-priests, had to practice the ritual hand washing before eating bread. And this is where we are where they come to Jesus and say, hey, your disciples aren't doing it. So what had started as a physical manifestation of a spiritual truth, it became a burden. And, and Jesus talks about that, right? Remember in Matthew 11, where he talked about the Pharisees' burden, and he said, well, you know, take my yoke because my burden's light. My yoke is easy. This is another example of that burden that isn't light, isn't easy. And if you didn't do it, you risked being excommunicated. And if that doesn't seem like a big deal to you in this day and time, in Jesus' time, if you weren't recognized by the temple, if, if you were excommunicated, excuse me, from the synagogue, you could have been exiled from your community. Doing business with strictly observant Jews would have been out of the question. You could have ruined your entire livelihood. And of course, that's life itself, right? There's, it's so interconnected here. And if you don't do it, what happens to your your children, what happens to your relatives? Are they by association also 
excommunicated after a sense. This was a big deal. So the Pharisees sort of bullied all Jews into it in this ritual hand washing. Except Jesus and his disciples don't seem to be particularly concerned with keeping their own sense of purity in that way. Now, okay, the idea that uh, the Pharisees had this kind of authority, it really isn't radical. They did. They did have the authority to, to make sure that uh, a teacher was accurately teaching scripture. So it's appropriate for their, within their cultural norm, to be approaching Jesus and, and watching him, plus all the miracles that Jesus is doing, they were the spiritual authority that was recognized by all of Israel to come and make sure that these were legitimate miracles. So their coming really wasn't, it wasn't out of character, it wasn't out of bounds, it really was what they had the authority to do. But you know, they had already judged against Jesus. They did, they judged against him already. And they had done so for a long time. This was a man who came from backwoods Nazareth, not Jerusalem. His family were craftsmen, not ones who studied and taught the Torah, right? Or even the larger Jewish law and the scriptures that once came off of those, right? He didn't come from the right studying environment. He didn't come from the right family. He didn't come from the right town. He's not a part of their hierarchy. He's not a Pharisee. He's not even an Essene. He may have sympathized with the Essenes, but he certainly wasn't one. But most importantly to them, to the Pharisees, Jesus had to be challenged because Jesus and his disciples outwardly, openly put no value pay no attention really to the Pharisees laws, to the Pharisees tradition. The halakha was not applicable to Jesus. He never referenced it. He never practiced it as far as we can tell. So Jesus answers the Pharisees accusations as he often does with a question. Let's go ahead and continue with Matthew 15 verses three through six. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Now, Mark talks about this also in Mark 7, and it's from that that we get the, the word uh, as far as devoted to God called Corbin. Uh, so I want to really explain what that is and, and what Jesus is talking about here. So Jesus is questioning the Pharisees' allowance of a loophole that allows adult children to get out of taking care of their elderly parents through the making of an oath to gift the temple treasury. As I said, Mark 7, 11, it records Jesus condemning the Pharisees for in, encouraging people to make such contributions instead of caring for their elderly parents in the name of Corbin. Now, Jesus is not, capital N-O-T, not condemning Corbin, right? The practice of Corbin, generally speaking, is what the Jews reference to the sacrifices and offerings that they gave to God. Overall, it's not just the specific case that Jesus is speaking of here. And you know, they do it for many reasons. Um, dem demonstration of love and, and devotion to God. You'd give a fellowship offering to express gratitude and thanks for all that God had done to bless them and to atone for sin, right? The sin offerings, the, the various, really Corbin represents the various offerings that God prescribes in Exodus through Deuteronomy for the people to give. That's called, uh, I think the plural is carbonot. That's what he's talking about here when he says Corbin. I think I said carbon because I've seen it spelled with an A as well. So forgive my uh, vacillation on that. But overall, what 
Jesus is calling Corbin is a reference to the sacrifices that people offer to God, the dedication to God. It's not wrong. As a matter of fact, it's scriptural. Once the pledge, of course, is made to make something Corbin, it can't be used for any other purpose, right? That's good and that's right. I don't know if you remember this, but if, you, if you're familiar with the story of Joshua, when Joshua first leads the people to fight against Jericho, one of the things that God tells Joshua to then tell the people is that everything within the, the city of Jericho that is not to be destroyed is to be offered to God. The gold, the silver, the bronze is his. Everything else is to be destroyed. It's all supposed to be dedicated to God. He would have used the word, well, the Hebrew equivalent of it, of Corbin, right? So I hope that's clear. Now, in Jesus's time, there are also some indications that the word was used um, kind of as a curse word. Uh, there's a recorded discussion that takes place between the two main schools of Pharisees during Jesus's time about a man who sees people eating figs from his trees. He shouts, Corbin to you at the people. In this case, the man is not offering the figs to God. He's basically yelling at the people to get their hands off his figs. <laughs> okay, so... So you can see where colloquially that it wasn't necessarily even something that was tied to an oath to God, although that is the overall intent of it. It may have been something to the extent of God is my witness, which Jesus already says you're not supposed to make oaths like that, but just giving you a little more history. Now, I believe in this case, what Jesus is talking about here and condemning the Pharisees for doing is trading atonement for future acquisitions to the temple treasury. I think that's what's going on here. And I think that there's a similarity between using Corbin to gain wealth and the selling of indulgences, which the Catholic Church did up until the 16th century when it was condemned at the Council of Trent, uh, 1567, I think. Using the trappings of righteousness, the religious leaders they call people pure through an impure action. And you can't fool God. You can't hide your intentions from God. He already knows them. He knows what's going on in your heart. So Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees for encouraging or manipulating the wealth of the people so that it goes to the temple rather than care of the elderly parents. This is what's happening here. And really, this is the epitome of pitting Jewish law against God's word. Jesus is showing the people and the Pharisees precisely how false teaching, and this would be a false teaching, no matter how it originally intended, because remember, the Pharisees, the pious ones, wanted to correct what the people before them, before the exile, had been doing wrong, right? And and that they had fallen uh, to the worship of false idols. So they overcorrected. And in doing so, they actually created false idols in their law. And it's just as bad. So no matter how it was originally intended, this law, which is now idolized, cannot stand against God's law. And Jesus is making that clear. So Jesus first invokes Exodus 20, verse 12, which promises long life. This is one of the Ten Commandments, which promises long life for those who honor their father and mother. And then in Deuteronomy uh, 5.16, Moses reminds the people again of this promise as he's preparing them. This is Deuteronomy is, is basically uh, Moses' last speech before he goes up and dies. Um, and in this case, he's promising, he's reminding them of the promise that God has given them by honoring your father and mother, that you will be guaranteed this long life. He says it again in Deuteronomy 5.16, that before they enter the promised land under Joshua's leadership, that they have to hold this deep in their hearts. Then Jesus next warns against cursing one's parents, and in so doing, he's citing Exodus 21.17 and also Leviticus 20 verse 9. 
Now, Jesus is later, later on in our study, we'll pick up on this. He's going to speak to the judgment that comes for those who choose to ignore the least of these, right? So if you're familiar with this, this is in Matthew 25, verses 42 to 46. I want to go ahead and skip ahead and look at what Jesus says about what happens to those who ignore caring for the least of these. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now these people, he dismisses them in the same way that he dismisses the evil, excuse me, the false disciples, because evil just means against God, right? Against the will of God. Everything that's not in the will of God, it, by definition, is evil. But what I mean to say is the false disciples that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 7, verse 23. And what he says to them, as you remember, is, Depart from me, you evildoers. Away from me. I never knew you. This is what he's going to say for those who don't care for the least of these. And the elderly parents who needed care, they would be included in the least of these, right? So Jesus is applying this same principle to them. And to make it even more clear, if that's not clear enough, Jesus tells the Pharisees that this is their choice. That they are choosing to keep themselves far from God. And he does it in verses 7 through 9. Let's go ahead and read those. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Now, Jesus is quoting Isaiah 29, 13 here. And Isaiah, when he spoke it, right? So Isaiah is before, actually before the Assyrians first attacked the northern kingdom. Isaiah is speaking and prophesying this. And he's referring to the ancestors of the Pharisees, the one the Pharisees are trying to overcorrect for, whose lip service and going through the motions, acts of service, the box checking that they did, it led them into exile, right? First to Assyria, then to Babylon. In fact, for Judea, it would have been only Babylon. Isaiah goes on to prophesy after this that God would completely take them by surprise and that their own wisdom and discernment would fail. Catching what I'm about to do here, right? Their own wisdom, their ancestors' wisdom and discernment. He's saying the same thing now. Their own law, their own rules, their own commands going to fail them. He warns those who think that their work is hidden from God, like the use of Corbin and the way the Pharisees are doing here, and who believe that they can edit and improve upon the word of God. I mean, this is completely appropriate from Jesus to quote Isaiah in this context. It's brilliantly appropriate. So the Pharisees are going to invoke God's name right? That's what they do. They invoke his name and his authority and portray themselves as the heirs to Moses. But they submit themselves not to the law that was given through Moses, but to their own man-made laws and traditions, and they make them superior to God's. <laughs> They're not fooling God. They're fooling themselves. And Jesus is about to, to call them blind because of it. In the Talmud, Rabbi Eleazar says this about scripture and tradition. He who expounds the scriptures in opposition to the tradition has no share in the world to come. A second Talmud commentary says, It is a greater offense to teach anything contrary to the voice of the rabbis than to contradict scripture itself. That's, wow, I mean, for them to write that, what was their mindset in writing that, right? Anyway, let's keep going. Back to the original tradition that Jesus is referencing here, the, that Jesus is disputing the man-made laws of ritual cleanliness, the hand-washing, 
The hand-washing laws were designed to keep the impurities that covered a Jew's hands from touching the food that was about to be eaten. That was the point of it. Because as we know, these cleanliness, cleanliness laws applied to all Jewish people. Jesus now is going to turn his attention away from the Pharisees. It's really the last time he addresses them here. And to the people in verses 10 and 11. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Bluntly speaking, Jesus is saying that the Pharisees' hand-washing laws are useless for maintaining purity before God. Because impurity starts in the heart, right? It doesn't start on your hands. It doesn't start in your food. It starts in your heart. It comes from within. And to me, this brings to mind what Jesus had said earlier when he confronted the Pharisees who had blasphemed him, when they blasphemed the Holy Spirit as the source of Jesus's power back in Matthew 12, verse 34. If you remember, he says that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Jesus is talking about wicked thoughts. He's talking about uh, a belief in lies and he's talking about idolatry. And these are all toxic ideas that make people impure before God in his eyes. And this is the whole point of those ritual laws in the first place that God declares when the priests had to go wash their hands, had to go wash their feet before entering his presence, his fellowship in the tabernacle and the temple, they had to spiritually wash themselves. It has nothing to do with what food they were taking in. Now, that's not to say that there aren't things out there that we intake that can defile us. I believe there are. And entertainment choices rapidly come to my mind, and I'm going to let you use your imagination, right? But there are some things that we expose ourselves to, our eyes, our ears, that darken us, right? Or they darken our spirit, right? Do you remember when Jesus talked about that uh, the eyes, right, that they that they were either clear or they they were they were not, right? That's that that what do you expose yourself to? Because I think what you expose yourself to can can open the door to darkness within, right? But it's still going to be something that you take into your heart. I think in this case, and what I want to be clear about in this case is Jesus is talking about the ceremonial cleanliness with regard to food. And what he's saying is it's not in anything that you, you, you have on the outside of you that you intake. Because what happens when you eat something is it eventually exits your body. So it's not going to be what causes you to be unclean. But Jesus is not talking about foods that are clean or unclean. As a matter of fact, Jesus is soon going to instruct both Peter and Paul that all foods are clean. First with Peter, let's go ahead and read what he says to Peter when he's up on a roof and praying in Acts 10 verse 15. The voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And then he says something else to Paul in Romans 14, verse 20. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. We're going to come back to that last statement in a, in a few minutes. Now I wonder, because of Jesus' words, if the disciples aren't part of that crowd, and, and if indeed the crowd is really comprised a lot of his disciples because he tells them to listen and understand. And we know that Jesus has said that only those with ears to hear, and he spoke to his disciples specifically about that, are capable of listening and understanding, right? And I think that's why after all Jesus said that, or rather Matthew said that Jesus mainly spoke to the crowds using parables. This is not a parable that he's using here. But the disciples, the completely human disciples, they're still listening, 
and learning how to apply God's truth, how to apply Jesus's wisdom to their lives and to their thoughts. Because they still have their minds calibrated with the world. And we know this because what they say next to Jesus in Matthew 15, verse 12, and they say, Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Of course, Jesus is aware of the toxic heart postures of the Pharisees, right? Of course, he knows that it's going to be offensive to them to hear that their own laws and that their own heart positioning has drifted away from God's because Jesus is only going to speak what he hears the Father say. So Jesus is in right alignment with God. So that must mean if you're getting offended by what Jesus is saying to you, that you're the one who's off, not Jesus, right? Of course, they're going to be offended. He's confronting their own sense of righteousness. So Jesus responds to their own perception that they're wiser than God, which is really, I mean, I don't think any one of them would have said that, although they did say that their law was to be held in higher esteem than God's. I don't know whatever could have brought them to that. I just don't. But anyway, he responds with an echo to a parable that he had spoken earlier, uh, the, the, the parable of the tares. This is an echo of that in verses 13 and 14. Let's read what Jesus says. He replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. So two, two different concepts here. Eventually, the tares, right? What's planted not by the father, because what he's saying here is that the father didn't plant these seeds. And we know already from the wheat and the tares, if the father didn't plant the seeds, the enemy is the one who's planted them. So I'm calling the Pharisees, at least their, their rules, tares and they're gonna be pulled up by the roots. The very traditions that are set in opposition to God will be what separates the Pharisees from the elect. Jesus spoke about this in the parable. He's, he's referencing it here. These are the seeds planted by the enemy, not God, and they will be permitted to grow for a time until they can be readily distinguished from the fruit that they bear, right? We know that the tares don't bear wheat. They bear really toxic, poisonous grain because bad trees can't bear good fruit, right? You see how the Sermon on the Mount, it keeps coming back and back again, like throughout Jesus's gospel here. So these just, these traditions are going to be exposed for their ungodly nature, and they're not going to be able to stand when it comes time in the day of judgment. And so what comes next is Jesus advises the disciples to stay away from them and away from their, their willful blindness or be led into that same pit of eternal fire that all trees that bear bad fruit are destined to go to, right? They're going to be chopped by the ax and thrown into the fire. Jesus is going to reiterate the same principle to the disciples in our next chapter, Matthew 16, when he refers to the Pharisees teaching as yeast. It's the same concept, right? The tares and the yeast, they corrupt the good purpose of the father and they blind the people to the nature of the bread, capital B, that comes from heaven. Now the Pharisees are the blind leaders. They have eyes, but they cannot see. Remember, this is how Jesus describes them in Matthew 13, verses 14 and 15. I mean, he, he describes this of all the people who, who have eyes but cannot see. But several of the Old Testament prophets, they warned that people were given eyes, but they were blinded by their rebellion against God. Isaiah 6, verse 10, when Isaiah is going before the throne of God. Jeremiah 5, verse 21, and Ezekiel 12, verse 2 all come to mind. Then I think about how the psalmist describes idols in Psalms 135 verse 16. He says this about idols. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. Now we've already talked about how these traditions and man-made laws are idolized as being superior to God's law and to God's wisdom. So these human commandments, human-made, they're, they are blind idols, 
that blind the Pharisees who then lead the people astray. Can you see how all that fits? Those who follow these false teachers will fall into the pit. These are the ones that Jesus says, away from me, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers, depart from me. Now remember, when Jesus asks the disciples, after he's, he's spoken all the parables in, in Matthew 13, he asks them in 13 verse 51, whether or not they've understood all the parables. And if you remember, the, the, the Pharisees, the disciples respond with, yeah, we get it, we totally get it. And then I referenced, if you were part of that, that study time, that there was going to come a time when Peter was going to ask for a future explanation and Jesus responds. We've come to that place now where we have that interaction between Peter and Jesus. Let's go ahead and read verses 15 and 16. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. This is a really good reminder <laughs> that uh, even the disciples who walked daily with Jesus, who saw him in all these wonderful interactions with the people, with the Pharisees, who, who received the double portion of of Jesus's teachings in every regard, that their understanding of what Jesus was telling them and showing them was a work in progress. Does that encourage you? That encourages me. Because <laughs> the same is true for us, because we know, as Paul tells us in Philippians 1 verse 6, that being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We're a work in progress until Jesus comes again. <laughs> the disciples were, we are. That's good news. They who had the greatest honor and privilege of being in his presence, they still needed it spelled out more often than, than once. And so the same is true for us when we are still learning what God's word means to us. Be encouraged. Jesus then explains the parable and the nature of purity before God in verses 17 to 20. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Simply put, sin originates in the heart, right? That's it. And it's that sin that separates us from God. So what's going on in our heart has the potential of separating us from God. Now, if our hearts are hidden in Christ, if we are hidden in Christ, we cannot be separated because of what he has done. But God knows the truth between lip service at church and having a heart that is positioned before God. And I believe that every one of you who's watching this, you are a part of that heart positioning before God because we go before the throne with our praise and worship and every time we seek him, he responds to us, he tells us this. A person's moral and their spiritual health, it is in no way dependent upon what our physical diet represents, right? Nor the dishes on which the food is eaten and served, right? They're just, there's no crossover in that. There's no danger in that. And this is in direct opposition to what the Pharisees are saying and enforcing with, with really the penalty of being removed from society. Now, just so we're clear, Jesus is not trying to counter God's word in Leviticus 11, which is the chapter that deals with clean and unclean foods. That guidance in particular was set to to help the descendants of former slaves, centuries of slavery, to set them apart from the influences of those who were still in bondage to sin in the, the land they were going to, right? We're talking about the Canaanites, all the different ites groups that, that they were coming to initially overtake, but eventually they live alongside of because of their own sinful nature in the book of Judges. So those laws, the Levitical laws, those were established so that they would be not exposed to eating food that was sacrificed to idols, that they would not be exposed to eating foods that wouldn't be kept in a way that would be healthy for them to intake. 
days later. So you get what I'm saying here. The purpose of that law, the purpose of those laws, was to help a group of people who had no idea how to live in right standing with God, how to live in a way that that they got the choice of what they ate because they were shown what they would eat in Egypt. And throughout the desert, throughout the wilderness, they were given manna, right? So this is the first time that they're going to have a choice and God is helping them establish good choices through that Leviticus 11. And I think that there are some laws that apply like that, right? Some of God's law applies as as, as a catalyst to heart change and to protect people from what makes them unsafe. And I think there are other laws that really protect our spiritual, right? Which is what's eternal within us. I know I'm speaking truth to this, right? So there are some laws that will never be unapplicable. The Ten Commandments. When is it ever going to be okay to commit adultery or murder? And we know from Jesus's beautiful discourse in the Sermon on the Mount, that that means even a higher standard of what it meant uh, when Moses gave that law down, right? We know Jesus is saying here what those laws are. They still apply and will always apply to us. Think about the feasts that, that God gave us. These are feasts to God, right? Passover and um, the Feast of the Trumpets, right? Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. These are feasts in, in perpetuity, because they're feasts to God. They're not necessarily feasts um, that applied only to the Hebrews when they crossed over into the Promised Land. We'll, got, we'll go into that discussion much more when we get into those feasts. Anyway, so I think this is why Jesus later differentiates through Paul, and I referenced this earlier, the difference between calling a group of foods unclean by their nature and the new mindset, the New Testament new mindset, which says that all foods that God calls clean are clean, but if eating them causes another to stumble in their walk with God, in their walk with Jesus, that a believer should refrain from eating those foods in the other's presence. If you want an example for now, okay, for me, and I think for most people, bacon is good. Bacon's good, y'all. Love bacon. But if you're inviting a seeking Jew or a seeking Muslim to have dinner with you, serving them pork might cause them to stumble, right? I think this is what Paul's talking about. Bacon is clean as far as God is concerned, but watch that you don't make people stumble by your eating of it. What we have to be aware of with regard to that is when people are coming alongside us when we're showing them what it means to walk with Jesus we want to show them what it's going to be like to sit at Jesus's wedding feast table because that's the invitation he offers his church his bride and so anything that would cause them to stumble from that anything that would cause them to think well this is my belief and you're saying that that my belief would never allow me to eat at Jesus's table no that's not what we're saying what we're saying is that my belief that bacon is clean in God's image is is not preventing me from eating at his table either. That's, I think, what we want to get at here. Little side note. Because impurity before God originates in the heart, we have to guard our hearts, as Solomon tells us in Proverbs 4, verse 23, when he says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And I believe he's talking about our eternal life here. I think he's talking about our, our spirit. What always, what Jesus calls us to in the eternal life. Now, since the heart is the true source of a person's character, this is why Jesus tells us the two most important commands to God are to guard, to, excuse me, to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your spirit and with all your strength, right? That's Deuteronomy 6, 4, 5. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself in Leviticus 19, 18. If your heart is positioned in love towards God with everything, if you give everything you've got in love towards God and you love everyone as a measure and as a, a response to that love for God, your heart is positioned in the right place that it doesn't have room for impure thoughts. It's being filled by something else. 
And when we're positioned in that way and we can remain in that heart that's filled with love, I believe that's what Jesus says makes us pure, right? A heart that is pure before God. Remember what he says in, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 verse 8 that a, a heart that is pure can see God, which is exactly what we're after in this teaching. And that's where I want to stop for today. We've covered uh, Jesus's response to the larger discussion about what makes one clean or unclean, that it comes from within, not from without. And I think this sets up a beautiful um, premise for what comes next with Jesus when he, he has a meeting next with a person who by all accounts to the Pharisees would have been considered unclean. And Jesus is going to meet with this person and do a miracle. So that's all we're going to do for today. We'll pick up next time with that wonderful meeting. And until that time, as always, you know I'm praying for you to guard your hearts and your minds to be rooted in Christ Jesus so that you can be pure and meet with the Father. So may your hearts be filled with love for the Father in all of its aspects with everything you do, when what you do with your hands, what you think with your, your minds, what you feel in your hearts, may it all be directed in love towards God and love towards God's creation. That's us. And may he guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And may you go blessed and prosperous in your coming week. Until next time, know that I love you and I'm always praying for you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. 